All right. Hey, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Texas Signal Signal Cast. I'm your host, Joe Desotel, and I'm here with my co host, Jessica Montoya Coggins. Hello, Jessica. Hey, guys. We're here, of course, for another week, a uh, roundup of Texas politics and a few interesting things today. It's been a very interesting last several weeks, but um, I think the main thing, Jessica, is just like looking at all the pile on on Greg Abbott. It seems like he's sort of gotten arrows coming at him from every direction uh, on the right, uh, on his flank from people who may want to run for office. And then, of course, from the Democrats, from some of the moves he's making uh, lately. And we've seen him really been on this sort of tour, uh, PR tour, where he's just kind of like doing anything to distract. Have you seen any of these um, these PR stunts he's been doing lately? Have you followed any of this? He was in Dallas recently for one. Yeah, yeah. He was just in Dallas a few days ago. Uh, he was doing a press conference in front of the K. Bailey Hutchison Convention Center, uh, you know, basically blaming the Biden administration uh, for an increase in uh, migrants coming to the border. Of course, that's actually, that has been happening for several months, even when uh, Trump was in office. Uh, and then he was also sort of saying, sort of preemptively saying, if there is a spike in COVID cases, this would be as a result of these children coming into, uh, coming across uh, into Texas, uh, even though, you know, this was the person who a week ago, you know, had the mask mandate repeal. Yeah, and also it turned out that he was slowing the testing down of migrants coming into the state. Uh, apparently, the, fed, the federal government was moving forward to do those tests, and he used whatever power he had to slow those tests down. And then we know he went right on uh, a, a local Fox network and basically blamed Biden administration for bringing in migrants and releasing them in the community with COVID-19. So, I mean, this harkens back to, I remember Dan Patrick a few years ago saying that, you know, they were bringing diseases with them across. And so this is just another play from that same playbook, another opportunity to malign immigrant community and, and, uh, and really just avoid any kind of accountability. But it's quite silly. We've had 2.3 million cases of COVID. Um, and we're talking about dozens of people who may or may not be positive uh, with COVID-19 and certainly not just being released strategically into the community to spread COVID, which is such an absurd uh, thing to say. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it comes on the heels of his uh, recent, uh, I, let's say this was just a couple of days ago and in, in previous to that. Um, the other thing he focused on was uh, a set of voter suppression bills that uh, are going to be going through the legislature. Uh, and he did this in Harris County because they were targeting essentially what was going on in Harris County, where they were doing a lot of innovative things to drive turnout, give more opportunity for people to show up to the polls. And so he went and, you know, expressed his support for these voter suppression bills. Um, and in a very similar fashion, it was, I, I think the numbers came out that uh, Attorney General Kim Paxton's investigation into voter fraud in Texas, they spent 22,000 hours of a lawyer's hours of going through and looking for uh, uh, voter uh, voter uh, violations. And they found 16 uh, wrong addresses on voter registration forms, 22,000 hours. Um, That's a and, lot of hours per, per case. I <laughs> know, uh, and a lot of smart people who were looking very hard. I mean, obviously wanting to impress their boss and, you know, um, and, and find something, I mean, Dan Patrick, what he he had like a million dollar reward for anybody that found uh, that found voter fraud. Like he was going to give. A I think he dollars. actually still owes the lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania a million dollars because yes, that's the person yeah, found because he, voter fraud. he found a, a case of a Trump supporter. Uh, you basically trying to vote twice or something, or vote yeah, vote on behalf of his deceased mother or something like that. Uh, but quite silly. It actually seems something like Democrats should be doing. We should offer a million dollars for anybody that could find voter fraud. And we already know they spent 22,000 hours and found essentially none. So, you know, I, I think um, just it just shows how much of a distraction this is. I mean, the migrant issue, very, very, very minuscule numbers compared to what's happening across the state. Uh, voter fraud, very minuscule numbers compared to even what they said the potential was that could be happening. Um, you know, all the while, again, as you mentioned, remove the mask mandate. We know the things that are really driving the numbers here. 
Um, but a lot of this seems to be a direct distraction of what is still going on in the fallout of the blackout from February. Seems like a year ago. I don't know what it does to me. I don't know about you, but it feels like. Yeah, I mean, it was just a, just a month ago too. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's still a devastating, devastating uh, thing for so many communities and, and families. Mm -hmm. And again, I think a lot of people are just glad it's over. They're glad the power's back. But at the end of the day, I mean, the legislature's in session. They've got a responsibility. We've got to get to the bottom of this. And, you know, it is getting really close to Governor Abbott. Uh, his appointees, uh, for, for folks who don't know the, the process, you know, they've heard a lot about ERCOT. ERCOT is uh, essentially the, the body of, of companies that operate within this deregulated energy market in Texas. Uh, they kind of oversee uh, the distribution of energy and the prices uh, that, you know, kind of oversee the market. Well, they are tacitly um, regulated by a body called the Public Utilities Commission. And Governor Abbott appointed all three of the Public Utility Commissioners who have since all three resigned. Uh, interestingly, um, two of them resigned um, within a couple of weeks of the storm. Two of them resigned. He took the third one and, and, and basically uh, gave him a, um, a promotion to chair. So he moved the third the remaining, the only remaining one uh, to, to chair the PUC. And then he recently uh, resigned himself just a couple of days ago. Uh, did you see what happened? Did you hear this phone call about this phone call he had? Yeah, I mean, this is basically he said that he was going to protect the profits of the people who, you know, capitalize off of this horrible storm. And, you know, this was also a, the case where during this uh, devastating couple of days, so several people died. You had young children dying of hypothermia. Um, you know, several people died of carbon monoxide. You know, people left, were left without power, without water. And to just hear this PUC chair basically, you know, not even caring about that, but his main focus was to make sure that these rich people who got rich off of, uh, you know, the, the, the blackouts that occurred for them to keep their profits. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, uh, it was, you know, even for, for people who have a cynical view of how these things work, that was a particularly egregious thing to hear and uh, not surprising then that he would, he would then resign. Right. And he basically told them that, you know, don't fear, you know, we'll make sure that the governor continues to appoint people that have your interests in mind. Uh, and then he basically said he expected to be the chair, uh, the loan commissioner and chair for about the next year. I think part of the reason of that is gets into sort of the nitty gritty of what's really going on behind the scenes with Republicans right now. And I think this is the biggest story in Texas that nobody's talking about, partially because it's convoluted, it's complicated, it's complex, um, and it doesn't draw a direct line to people's daily lives. But it's really important people understand that uh, the governor appointed this guy. Uh, he now resigns, but for weeks, Dan Patrick has been calling for him to resign and other people have called for him to resign. Democrats have called for him to resign. But it's just interesting, interesting to see that where Dan Patrick and Governor Abbott have normally stood side by side on most of these major issues, that there's a lot of daylight now here that Dan Patrick is using to directly attack the governor. Um, and it's really it comes down to this. Uh, and the reason that guy even made those statements on that call was because there's an effort now in the legislature to take those profits that he was talking about saving, reprice the energy that people bought during that time. Uh, those people, we heard those horror stories of having 10,000, 5,000, $15,000 energy bills. Uh, those people, um, there's a bill to uh, retroactively essentially reprice uh, the energy from that time and, and sort of either give breaks back to consumers, back to the, the rate payers, which are of course constituents uh, of these of these guys. And and this guy, this commissioner, D'Andrea was basically saying, don't you don't have to worry about that. We're gonna make sure that doesn't go through. We'll make sure that there's no repricing that happens. Um, and sort of that's the tiff that's happening right now between Dan Patrick and Governor Abbott, where Governor Abbott 
is saying this repricing is essentially illegal. You can't do it. It's unconstitutional against the Texas state constitution to do anything retroactively. So we can pass laws that affect, you know, from the, the time that they become a law into the future, but we can't pass a law and then go back and undo, a, in this case, their, a contract uh, that, that is in place already. Um, but Dan Patrick is moving forward and, and the people in the Senate who passed this bill before it was even filed, by the way, um, is, are basically saying they're, they're gonna force the Public Utilities Commission to reprice. Um, and then I guess, I don't even know how it will work, give money back to consumers who were charged over that rate or whatever. Uh, but it's an interesting thing to see because it's, it's, it's clear market manipulation, even though the market itself was the problem to begin with um they are now taking the government hand which they always you know fight against uh and saying they're going to come make these moves and tell these companies how much they can charge for their product um because they have a black eye and they they don't want to really address the larger issue of the fact that the market was deregulated over the last 10 years so i don't know have you i don't know if you've been paying a lot of close attention to this but it's going to be interesting to see how um how Dan Patrick sort of continues to elevate this this drumbeat against Governor Abbott. Well, because I imagine if you did receive a bill, you know, let's say twelve thousand dollars or something outrageous like that, I don't think you necessarily want to hear from your governor like, oh, well, sorry, this is written into the Constitution. There's really nothing that we can do to retroactively fix this. Um, so this that is maybe something that I believe that Patrick has really tapped into and figured out that this is not a popular sentiment. Um, and, you know, as to his, his possibly challenging Abbott, I know he has denied that, though he's done that before. I think he told David Dewhurst he was never yep. going to run against him. And we see how that turned out. You sure did. Yeah. Did you actually listen to the tape? I, I haven't heard it, but the, the I listened to, I listened to portions of it. Just the, <laughs> the PUC chair, it, it mm -hmm. does make you, it does truly make you want to punch a wall, like just how arrogant it sounds. And it, it reminded me though, in the days after uh, the storm, uh, you know, Democratic members of Congress, including Joaquin Castro, wrote to the PUC and, you know, the letter that they sent back, Castro called it like the most arrogant thing he's mm -hmm. ever received. It was it was just basically um, gibber like not even not even answering questions and basically almost insinuating, how dare you even ask us these things? So, you know, this is a, a body that has just acted uh, just corruptly for years. And when something actually now has happened where they are actually called to do something, uh, they fall back into their trappings of just, just sort of being uh, the, the, the vessels for, for a lot of uh, rich Texans to get even richer. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. So, you know, the initial estimate was 26 billion uh, is how much they think people were overcharged in that little tiny window of time. Um, and so, you know, I think we mentioned here before, but those same group of companies uh, have donated over $26 million to Greg Abbott uh, over the last decade or, or so since he's been in statewide office. So he has a, you know, a strong incentive to continue to perform for them. And so I think that is, like you said, something that Dan Patrick has, has, has caught on to. Uh, I think it's real. Uh, how much he can continue to that drumbeat to elevate beyond um, you know, this sort of blip in time, I don't know, but he's been a very savvy politician and it's hard to imagine that he's not really, really actually onto something here that he wouldn't take this chance to really come out publicly and attack the governor unless he knew, you know, like they say, like, if you're going to come for the king, you, you better, you, you best know, not miss it. yeah, you best not miss. So <laughs> I think that's, that's sort of the situation we're in. And it, it, it really, it seemed even weirder, just like, about a week or so ago before this tape came out, why Dan Patrick was beating his drum so hard. And then the tape came out and made me think that like, maybe he knew of the tape already um, be because it seemed a little too like, like I know he's Machiavelli and, and he's smart. He, and he teed it up cunning. really well for himself. It but was. yeah, it's almost like if you knew this was gonna happen, you would have done exactly what Dan Patrick had done over the previous two weeks. I don't know, maybe, maybe Dan Patrick has an inner Omar in him. I don't know if any, anyone's familiar with the wire. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe he does. Yeah, I, I kind of think, I kind of think he does. I, I, I don't mind giving him some credit, but I feel like that was, uh, that was some premonition that, that was there. But um, 
So yeah, you know, uh, interestingly, Dan Patrick isn't the only person who has uh, criticized the governor. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but now that McConaughey, we've we've talked about him, it's kind of bubbled up a little bit, and now it's almost just like growing off of its own sort of success. And I don't know if it was you, but somebody on the Signal team, I think it was you, basically said, "I want to be careful how much we put into his head because he starts seeing too much. He might actually think it's." it's real <laughs> and he has a real chance to this but um he was uh he was criticizing abbott for removing the mask mandate and so you know i thought that was interesting it was probably the first time he's directly you know accused any or made a political statement um and it wasn't really hard hitting necessarily but it was enough to write stories about for some so yeah, I, I mean, it's uh, there. There is a story that I think Patrick Svidic uh, wrote for the Texas Tribune tr trying to get to the bottom of McConaughey's uh, political leanings. And there's really not much there. He did vote in 2018 and then in 2020. Um, but primary, I think you have to go back to 2012. And it wasn't actually clear to me which which if he had a party on that one or if he, um, you know, obviously in Texas, we don't have a we don't have a, a party affiliation. Um, which is a little weird to me, actually, uh, now that I think about it. But yeah, I mean, he, this is kind of the, the, the thing as he talks about where he doesn't really have that much of a political policy background. Um, however, mm -hmm. I think maybe he did feel criticizing Abbott for the best mandate repeal was as probably as, as non-controversial of a thing you could probably say <laughs> uh, even if in texas that there are there is still a large contingent that that does agree with with abbott's decision yeah yeah there definitely is uh and i'm seeing that article you're talking about um his politics remain a mystery yeah i mean that's absolutely right but um we'll see We'll see what what else he's got to say. There, there is an SNL sketch. Uh, this was a couple of years ago where, you know, McConaughey, it's like it's a Thanksgiving dinner. And I think this was right after the 2016 election. So you have like all these family members that are arguing. And then all of a sudden Adele starts playing and the family like just calms down. So maybe that maybe that's his only political leaning. I think that's I think that's what he's thinking. I think he's like, hey, I can bring I I'll can just, bring I'll just play together. Adele and then we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I want to talk about Ken Paxton a little bit. I don't know if you saw this, but there is a bill uh, that would essentially uh, expand Ken Paxton's uh, role as attorney general with regards to uh, abuse of office cases. Very interesting, considering he is currently under FBI investigation for abuse of office. Um, and, and among other things, I guess we should say, uh, but the other interesting thing about this is that it happens to be going through his wife's committee. So for folks who don't know, our currently indicted Attorney General Kim Paxton, his, his wife uh, is uh, a senator uh, from Dallas. Um, um, her name escapes me. I'm sorry, Jessica. Yeah, Angela Paxton. Thank you, Angela Paxton. So, um, you know, this isn't even the first time she's been sort of criticized for handling a bill that would potentially directly affect something that her husband is currently in trouble for. So uh, last session, there was a bill that she authored that would have essentially made legal what he was currently been indicted for five years for, uh, which was essentially a securities uh, violation and, and not essentially telling somebody you're trying to sell stake in a company to that you are being paid to do that. Um, and so, you know, it's just interesting to see how sort of shameless these folks are in, in their attempts to be corrupt or to, you know, excuse themselves for any type of potential accountability that they could be facing in the future. But uh, yeah, I mean, it also sort of bypasses local, local prosecutors as well, um, you know, for that sort of gives the attorney general this larger discretion. And it, it, it kind of just always reminds me that you know, Republicans always talk about local control, local control, and then you have something like, you know, a, pr a prosecutor trying to, to charge or to, to go after, you know, someone for, uh, for something that they, 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 they've run afoul of the law, and then, you know, Paxton can kind of swoop in and, and uh, deny that. It's, sort of, it's like kind of the same thing when, you know, states and municipalities were trying to, 
enact COVID restrictions and, you know, Abbott would, was squashing that. So mm-hmm. they always talk about local control, but I don't really know if they actually buy that. Yeah, no, they've been, yeah, they've been taking it away for the last, at least two cycles, they've kind of pivoted to, I mean, to their credit, they, they, they run every partisan, you know, statewide office in the whole, across the state. So local officials, even if they're nonpartisan, because they're on the city council level, I mean, that's literally the next place to go if you're going to be bashing progressives and liberals. So that's what they're doing. So, you know, I mean, he's, Kim Paxson's sort of been a common theme here on the podcast, but um, there's another sort of quasi-politician out there uh, who I think people were throwing their name around for the future, uh, and that's uh, Art Acevedo. And I don't know if you, um, you probably remember, I know you, you, you live in Dallas, but he was the uh, police chief for Austin before moving to Houston. And it was just announced that he has now hit it for Miami. Um, but really everywhere this guy goes, he's a really good politician. I don't know if you've ever seen him, but, um, yeah, yeah. I was, I was a little surprised by the decision just cause he seemed to be pretty broadly popular in Houston. A lot of people had been talking about him as a, a potential candidate down the line. Um, our, our buddy McConaughey actually spoke about Art Acevedo on uh, the pot that one of the, the podcasts that, that stirred the speculation about a gubernatorial run, you know, talking about how wonderful he was. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it, it was very surprising. Um, I'll, I, I'd be interested to possibly see how he fares in Florida. Uh, Florida has, I think, maybe even a, a more combative Republican governor than even we do in Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how, how that goes for him. But yeah, I, it was very, I, I think a lot of people were, were and I think even the Mayor Turner uh, in Houston <laughs> maybe did, well, was even taken by surprise by that announcement. Yeah, it seems so. And I mean, it came right after Turner's announcement that he was going to give more money to the police, um, which was interesting, you know, given everything that's going on right now, certainly counter to the narrative that Republicans are painting of what cities are doing. And the biggest city in Texas is talking about increasing funding to police. So uh, it's an interesting timing. I think people were Everywhere he goes, like I said, people assume that he's a he's going to run for office, and then he just goes somewhere else. <laughs> but but he has a unbelievable ability to get attention, stay uh, stay in front of the camera. But he's a good sort of glad handing type of you know uh, retail politician. I've seen him um, you know here in Austin and you know at events and press conferences and things like that, and gotten to talk to him um, a couple times actually when there was like a active event going on, like a few blocks from a house, uh, I think there was like, somebody was held up in a house and they had to send the SWAT or whatever. And he was, he was there himself, um, which I think I probably saw on Twitter. And I just went out, walked down the street and like talked to him. And um, so, yeah, he's very personable. So it's interesting to see him go. um, And yeah, I think it was a bit of a surprise and the timing was, seemed a little bit weird and, But it seems like he also was a bit controversial, even amongst progressives. Uh, I don't think progressives would necessarily consider him to be the biggest champion of uh, progressive causes, and he never claimed to be either. Um, We had a a pretty hard-hitting op-ed in the Signal that we we published this week that uh, was was sort of uh, to to that point about Mm -hmm. a a lot of the things that, that he did. In, uh, in Houston. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I was saying, yeah, uh, queuing that up, some of the coverage that we've been doing on this on the signal. Um, and and so, you know, one of the, one of the other big uh, stories that we've been, we were covered on uh, the signal uh, today, as a matter of fact, is a lot of the uh, anti-Asian violence that we've been seeing. Uh, and certainly that conversation has been sparked by the actions what took place in Atlanta. Um, and, you know, our own congressman from Central Texas here had some words to say about that. Did you, did you say about this or would Chipper yeah, say? Yeah, it was um, pretty appalling. So there was a hearing that was being held uh, in a, a, a subcommittee of the Congressional uh, Judiciary Committee, and it was being, it was to, uh, to address discrimination against Asian Americans. So a number of members of Congress were speaking, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, 
uh, the actor Daniel Day Kim was there, several professors. So they were just basically hearing from, from people about uh, what has been happening with, with Asian Americans and hate crimes have, have risen exponentially over the year as well. And then also this coming just less than 48 hours after the, the tragedy in Atlanta. Um, and so Chip, Chip Roy really basically took umbrage with this hearing, basically saying that you are trying to police rhetoric uh, he used again some very uh, discriminatory some some uh, words against China. Uh, he then had a very strange, uh, almost extolling of of lynchings. Basically, it was uh, very very uh, awful, and he was criticized by several of his colleagues, including Ted Lieu and Grace Meng. Uh, but he is actually not back down from that uh, in, a, in a short statement to Mediaite, he kind of basically wrote, you know, no apologies. He, he feels the way he feels that this is sort of an attempt to police rhetoric. Yeah, I think he was quoting like a Toby Keith song or something that people had took an issue with, something about a, 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 a saying in Texas, actually. That, I've, I've never heard this saying, but- You okay. never heard, <laughs> you're not familiar with lynching lingo, uh, Jessica? Um, <laughs> No, but it was something to the fact of, you know, find, find the tallest tree and the longest rope, you know? Um, so yeah, and I didn't get what context that Chip Roy was actually trying to make a point about. Um, I, I think, you know, he was sort of saying that a lot, you know, these terms that have been used over these years that many Republicans, um, you know, how they've described the coronavirus in, in these horrible ways, which I, I have truly, I think words have, words matter. Um, you know, we've seen horrific rises in violence, um, you know, just, just, just this week. I know that there's, there's been multiple, um, you know, Asian Americans that have just been pushed over in streets in San Francisco and New York City. And, and, and honestly, actually, I, I think about the shooting that occurred in El Paso several years ago, where you had a shooter who had clearly internalized a lot of the language of immigrants. And he drove all the way from Allen, Texas to El Paso. That's nine hours. So words really do matter. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I think that was also something that a lot of Chip Roy's colleagues were, were trying to, to let him know that when you use these offensive terms, people hear that, that has an impact on, on families all over this country. And so Chip Roy, I guess, just wanted to continue the, the Toby Keith song. So, well, um... Yeah, it's just really unfortunate. Every now and then Chip Roy tries to come across as like a, you know, common sense, normal dude, but he's he's not really. And he's, he's also not a native Texan. I didn't realize this. I think he actually moved here in his in his 30s. And I was just looking now that Toby Keith is actually from Oklahoma. Um, so not that I, I think anyone who wants to call themselves a Texan is a Texan. But again, I never heard this this apparently like this phrase that we just yeah you know, right but it's also something to just like come here and then like try to close the door behind you or pull the ladder up and 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 tell other people they're not welcome here which is what they do all the time like if you're from california or you're a liberal or you're from whatever you're not welcome here um or austin isn't even really part of texas like they'll say anything so yeah, it's 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 really it's just awful to hear that, and then it is ironic that they're not from Texas because we don't care that they're not from Texas. Uh, you know, like uh, Lyle Lovett said, you know, it's, you're not from Texas, but we'll we'll love you, and Texas loves you anyway. You know, um, we are the friendship state, but uh, it's hard to believe that these days with some of the rhetoric we're hearing from these people uh, that are elected. Um, but you know, so one of the things that we're trying to do, of course, is to uh, make make people you know more engaged and to think a little bit outside of the boxes we created a bracket for uh i guess it's for the for the gubernatorial races coming up in 2022 uh top 16 who who belongs in the bracket we've we published this on the signal so so that our readers and listeners can chime in uh come up with you know um ideas uh who, who should be on our bench who should be looking to in the future for leadership uh, and so one of the things we are doing as staff, of course, is like, you know, coming up with our own brackets. So I don't know if you've gotten to make yours yet or had any fun with I that. I did. I had, I put a lot of thought into it too. So <laughs> I think, so each of us sort of did this, um, you know, a, a round of 16. And I think actually we, we might sort of have like an expanded 
bracket where we might have sort of like a celebrity region, a sports region, and sort of two political regions. Uh, but for my personal bracket, I sort of put everyone together. Um, so I, I had Beto as my number one seed. I had McConaughey number two. I didn't feel great about it, but I, I still think that he is pretty serious about this. Uh, and then Lena Adalgo, I, I put as my third seed. Uh, they made the, the final round of four. I had Mark Vesey as my, my fourth, fourth seed, uh, but I did have him getting upset by Sheila Jackson Lee. <laughs> What about Mark my, Cuban? My apologies, my apologies to, to Congressman. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, so I, I did have uh, Mark Cuban in there and I put him up against Michael Sorrell. Michael Sorrell is the president of Paul Quinn College. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard, heard him speak, but he is very, very effective. So that I actually had Sorrell uh, passing Cuban. Um, I think Cuban has sort of too many libertarian tendencies, especially if he's, he is actually gonna run as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And I think he would, though. I think he would probably he would run as a Democrat, but tell us why our marketing and, and our message is all wrong and what we have to do. To fix it. He would, he, it would go it would devolve into like a Shark Tank presentation. I, that's exactly what I was thinking, too. <laughs> but that would be actually kind of funny. But uh, but yeah, I mean, we would love for him to invest in the Democratic Party. I mean, why not? You know, um, he, he did. You know, he did campaign uh, for, for, for Joe Biden this this last uh, this last election. That's good. Um, I mean, he's yeah, very outspoken. he's he's very he was very outspoken against Donald Trump, uh, I think, actually, because he kind of had a personal relationship with him at one point. So. Yeah, he's pretty good on the on the, you know, the rhetoric stuff of inclusion. I think he's pretty good on that. And of course, uh, taking things seriously, like uh, opening up, you know, the Mavericks field for, uh, you know, as a vaccination center, I think he did. Um, or, or was, was it a, a testing? A, a voting voting center and voting then, uh, center and then that's uh, testing as well. Yeah, and then uh, once they started letting folks back to games, he opened the games up to first responders who have been vaccinated first. I think as the first people could come back to see. Yeah, and he, he he takes very good care of uh, you know the players, the employees. Um, he he had to, he paid a bunch, paid the salaries for a lot of the employees that uh, you know work in that air and work in the American Airlines Center. Um, and uh, it has a very good relationship with, with you know, the community there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we, we had a lot of fun with this. Uh, so I, I think folks can probably envision brackets that will have Beyonce. I think they'll have Megan Thee Stallion. Uh, um, yeah, I wanted to put uh, H-E-B and Whataburger in my bracket because I feel like <laughs> I feel like they would get a lot of votes if they were somehow on the ballot. But but yeah, I mean, it's definitely a really it's a fun thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, one of the goals, at least, is to expose Texans to different uh, leaders that we have out there that we haven't really considered before. Uh, and maybe they haven't considered running for office either. But, you know, our, our bench, we, we have such a big state, so diverse and, and so many people and different regions. We, we can be insular and you can kind of think of what goes on in DFW as sort of like, a whole world apart of what goes on in South Texas. And I know we feel that way in Austin sometimes in our own bubble. So, you know, it's really good to hear these names like Clay Jenkins in, in, in Dallas County, the, the judge there who's doing great things. And, and you know, just hearing people's names come up around the state. Uh, I know pa Greg Popovich was, uh, was a name that's popped up uh, a, few, a few times. So um, I really remember James, is it James Earl Jones or... Uh, Oh no! What's the actor that played in Men in Black with Will Smith? Oh, Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Na no, native, native, yeah. native Texan. I, yeah. I also, so, yeah. uh, I think um, Jamie Fox would be a really interesting consideration if, you, if, like, you go on the more celebrity side. Um, I think he actually has a lot more substance, substan uh, substantial policy views than than Matthew McConaughey. Um, so that, that was actually, and I, he actually has done quite a bit for the Democratic Party. So one of our other colleagues that included them in their bracket and that actually got me thinking like hey you know what if you were going to go the celebrity route that would actually not be a bad choice yeah 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 and I feel like it would be too humbling for celebrities to like say run for city council or their state rep or something they would feel like they needed to run for governor or some statewide thing which fine whatever but you know I, I, if, if these folks don't run getting them more involved in the party and uh, in the infrastructure building of the party because they could do so much with their celebrity power and status um, to help uh, bring people out, get people involved, make it fun, use their creativity and their skills to, to do that, I think is something that we have to, to cultivate over the next few years and bringing them in because um, everybody wants to be part of a winning team. And 
when you see that you you you've gotten some star power and, and Beto's done a lot a lot for us in that in that area. But uh, yeah, we have Texas has got tons of star power and it's mostly on our side. So we've got to figure out a way to leverage that into the future. Um, but yeah, with that said, is there anything else? I don't, I don't think so. I, uh, I, I actually just watched a Tommy Lee Jones movie yesterday. I always watch yeah. the fugitive on St. Patrick's okay. Day. So my St. Patrick's Day movie. So. Really? Is there a connection to Irish? <laughs> there's, a, there's a scene where Harrison Ford is, it's, it's like he's in Chicago and he's running through the St. Patrick's Day parade and uh -oh. um, they, they died the, the river. In, in the green. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the fugitive is a St. Patrick's Day movie. The in, way my, in, die, in my canon, it is a St. Patrick's Day yeah. movie. The way Die Hard is a Christmas movie, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. It's good to know. Cause I didn't know that there was a lot of a uh, breadth of, uh, you know, uh, movies out there for St. Patty's Day, but it's good to know that there's, uh, I could always put The Fugitive on on March 17th. So, uh, okay, well, great. Well, with that, I think we'll wrap it up for this week. Uh, thanks again to all our patrons out there who contributed, make sure this happens. We really appreciate it. Uh, our engagement on social media is up. Our, our, our views on the site are up. So everything you're doing is really working. Uh, and remember, this is this is we have a bigger goal here to uh, to uh, get more progressive policy in the state and and see these these young up and coming leaders, um, you know, take their take their place in the future of Texas. So thanks for everything you're doing and, um, you know, help us by sharing, subscribing um, and just follow us on Twitter and TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, we're everywhere, right? Like I pretty much, I think the only place I don't think we're on right now is um, what's the chat room? The chat, I, feel like, I feel like really old now, but oh, that, yeah. Clubhouse, it's called Clubhouse. Clubhouse. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have not been on, have you used that yet? No, I have not been on. no, it seems like it's just for like Bravo celebrities, I don't know. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, well, I'm not a Bravo celebrity. Uh, maybe day, we'll maybe. have some. One day, maybe. Bravo. All right. Well, thank you all. And until again, uh, until next week. Bye, guys. Later, y'all.